Aloha, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Christy Govella, and I am the director of the Center for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on undersea cables and geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific. So this webinar today is bringing together some of the work that we've been conducting over the last year as part of a larger research project on undersea cables, geoeconomics, and security in the region. Um, and the staff of the Center for Indo-Pacific Affairs will put a link in the chat to um, some further information about that project. Um, although people rarely think about them, networks of undersea cables form the critical infrastructure that really enables the communication and connectivity upon which societies and economies are built. Um, you often hear in the news these days that over 95% of global internet traffic relies on these cables and they transmit approximately 10 trillion in financial transactions uh, data daily through the global economy. So if they're destroyed, this could bring down the communication systems of a country and even minor damage can cause significant disruption. Consequently, undersea cables really exist at the intersection of a lot of different policy issues, including maritime policy, um, economics, international law, governance, and more. So clearly, this is truly a global issue, but we're focusing in this project on the Indo-Pacific region in particular because it has been the most active region for cable construction in recent years and because these networks in the region have been drawn into the dynamics of U.S.-China strategic competition. Of course, Hawaii and the University of Hawaii have played an important role also in undersea cable networks, given their location and the expertise of many people on island. So in October of last year, the Center for Indo-Pacific Affairs convened a two-day private workshop in Honolulu in partnership with Keio University and Khalifa University with the support of a grant from the Japan Foundation. And we brought together experts um, from the US, the Indo-Pacific, Europe, and the Middle East, as well as local folks based in Honolulu. And we tried to collect a group of academics, think tankers, and government and private sector representatives to be able to really get the right mix of perspectives to discuss a complex set of questions. Namely, why is undersea cable competition intensifying in the region? How are threats to these networks evolving? And what are the implications for regional resilience? And how do perspectives differ across countries and across the public and private sectors? And what does this mean for regional conflict and cooperation? So out of this conflict conference so far, we've uh, produced four policy briefs and an additional nine journal articles that are in various stages of publication and review. And the staff at the Center for Indo-Pacific Affairs will uh, drop some of the links to those articles that have been released as part of our Indo-Pacific Outlook policy brief series. And we'll also post those on YouTube when the video goes up. Um, we'll also share the other articles as they come out in the future. So today you'll be lucky enough to hear from two of our participants, um, but before I turn the floor to them, I want to just briefly give you a sense of the top line findings from the project um, from our combination of thematic and geographic research approaches. So first, in terms of threats, um, we discussed a wide variety of risks to cables. Most cable damage results from relatively routine uh, risks from natural and man-made uh, sources. These would be things like wildlife attacks or current abrasion or ships anchors that are dragged along the seabed. Um, in more dramatic non-routine episodes, you hear about risks from disasters like earthquakes, tsunami, cyclones, and volcanic eruptions, which have occurred uh, in recent years. And then the thing that's been in the news the most has been uh, non-routine man-made risks from espionage and sabotage, which have really received uh, increasing attention from the government and private sector. But for the most part, these concerns and these risks are not new. Undersea cables uh, are a point of vulnerability and conflict. And there are some new technologies such as uncrewed undersea vehicles that may be creating some changes in risk. Um, which is covered by one of our collaborators. Um, but many of these threats have historical precedent, um, and several papers uh, discuss uh, these situations from the Spanish-American War, World War I, and the Cold War. And we'll hear more about those later today. So instead of the risks themselves, um, it is often the understanding of these risks that is evolving. And you know, again, this is due to geopolitics, which has really led to the securitization of these cables, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. As the maritime domain has been securitized uh, due to increasing conflict and tension, particularly around uh, territorial disputes and gray zone conflict um, that has fed into some of this. And also we've seen the widespread securitization of the economic domain um, with a lot of concern about things like weaponized interdependence and economic security. 
So of course, China has been at the center of those discussions um, with Chinese investment becoming very prominent in the area of cable networks, uh, Chinese companies increasing their involvement in the sector, and also discussions about potential cybersecurity risks or risks from financial dependence on China. So this has been much of what has uh, made it into the news. And in response, concerned countries have tried to use their own investment instruments to try to alter the geography of undersea cables to uh, better protect, they feel, their uh, resilience or their economic security. So how are these dynamics reshaping cables? Well, in the project, we've clearly seen evidence that it's changing their roots. So although China was expected to be a growing hub for connectivity and cables, there's been a fall in new cables linking China with the rest of the world as companies pursue alternative routes. Um, in some cases, routes of cables have been adjusted to avoid contested areas like the South China Sea, where past cable projects have faced challenges due to things like delays in permitting, due to conflicting claims over territory. And then in other cases, we see that geopolitics is invigorating investment among countries, as I mentioned, who share security concerns. And this is also affecting the landscape of the cable sector in some cases. So for example, we've seen countries like the US, Japan, Australia, and others mobilize investment um, to compete with China. We've seen a lot of discussions, particularly in the Pacific Islands region, which we'll hear about from one of the speakers today. Uh, we saw the Quad announce the creation of a partnership for cable connectivity and resilience. Um, that being said, Chinese companies remain quite cost competitive, and that remains uh, very appealing to some people who consider this to be mostly a matter of business decisions. Overall, um, one finding I do want to highlight before we get into the discussions is that the extent to which this discourse of geopolitics and securitization um, the extent to which it resonates really varies strongly across the region. It varies among different countries in the region, and it varies across the public versus private sectors. So for some, um, these cable networks are primarily an issue of economic development and connectivity, and security concerns don't seem as convincing or as uh, pressing on when they think about their priorities. And in the private sector, there are also uh, many perspectives that are similar, and you know the sets of concerns sound different than the ones that are coming from some of the regional governments. So we'll talk more about that today, and we'll also talk about the question of whether these recent initiatives are actually moving towards greater resilience in cable networks, which is really an open question. So now I'd like to briefly introduce the other two speakers for today's webinar. We're truly fortunate to be joined by two wonderful experts on this topic, and it's been such a pleasure collaborating with them over the past year. So first, we'll hear from Dr. Motohiro Tsuchiya. Dr. Tsuchiya is Vice President for Global Engagement and Information Technology at Keio University and a professor at Keio University Graduate School of Media and Governance. Um, and he's done a great deal of work on the impact of the information revolution on international relations, global governance and information technology and cybersecurity, including a longstanding research interest in undersea cables. So he'll kick off um, the presentations with a more historical and personal look at undersea cables to give us some context for these discussions. And then our second presentation will be from Dr. Amanda Watson. She is a fellow at the Department of Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University, and her research interests include digital technology in the Pacific, mobile telephones in Papua New Guinea, and strategic uses of information and communications technology in development efforts. So today she'll share her work for the project on developments with undersea cables and different viewpoints in the Pacific Islands and among other regional partners, which again has been a key area of focus in recent policy discussions. So we're so honored to have Dr. Suchia and Dr. Watson with us today. They'll each make opening remarks for about 12 minutes, and then we'll have time for discussion. Uh, we'll be taking questions from the live audience via the Q&A box, so please feel free to type your questions and submit them at any time. So with that, I will hand the floor to Dr. Tsuchiya for his opening remarks. Aloha, thank you very much. Uh, good morning from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, this is Motohiro Tsuchiya, professor at Keio University. So thank you, Christy, for having me uh, at this webinar. So uh, let me use slides to show some maps and photos. Um, the I want to talk about the historical context of submarine cables and the cables development and focusing on Japan and the Hawaii in the late 19th century and early 20th century. So the first cable was laid in 1851 in the English Channel. 
Uh, right after that, uh, in 1872, the first submarine cable came to Japan from Shanghai. So the cable was laid by a Danish company. But so it was a big surprise for the ordinary Japanese people uh, at that time. So the um, biggest impact is still we can see. So here is a monument of the first submarine cable laid in Nagasaki. So we can see still this monument in the nearby uh, older cable landing station. And um, this is a slice of the first cable. Uh, it was already abandoned, of course, but so somebody picked up from the um, bottom of the sea and showing in, in a museum uh, these days. And so um, we are also keeping the first cable landing station in Nagasaki. This is not an uh, original location. Uh, uh, it was moved from the original location, but we are still keeping the most of the um, um, uh, building. And so um, this is a part of the uh, uh, modern Japanese history. And, but at that time, uh, there are many cables are laid in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. Here is a map of the cables in the wall. So lots of cables are, uh, are, are laid to connect uh, uh, all uh, many parts of the world. And I found this map. So this says secret in Japanese uh, language. And Dr. Uh, um, um, Ko Koichiro Komiyama and I went to an uh, archive in Nagasaki. So the archive is uh, keeping a lot of uh, documents and so articles and other things in the, um, uh, inside the old building. So this map was drawn in 1942. So it is during the wartime. Um, here's a map of the Japanese cables at that time. So it might be somehow uh, difficult to look at on your computer screen, but here's a map and um, uh, uh, surrounding regions. So I will zoom up of some of the part. So uh, Tokyo, Nagasaki, Shanghai, you know the um, um, locations of these cities. So first cable was laid between Nagasaki and Shanghai. But there are more cables after that, so spreading from Japan. The one of them is uh, uh, from Tokyo to Ogasawara, Boning Island. And, those ca and that cable was uh, extended to Guam, Yap, and Palau. So those uh, islands were uh, under the Japanese uh, control at that time. And another cable was connected to Busan uh, on Korean Peninsula. And of course, Okinawa and Taiwan. So those cables are um, kind of um, um, uh, intention of the Japanese empire. I, I will use that, uh, I use that term um, from the historical perspective. But so um, those cables are connected to, uh, for communication between those cities and areas uh, at that time. So those cables were uh, are used for uh, colonial uh, um, um, control. And here's, um, I want to show some pictures of the old time, uh, old time uh, cable landing station. This is a, a Hokkaido Island. So at that time, the Karafto, so or Saharin, the south part of the Karafto was part of Japan. And so those um, uh, areas are connected by undersea cables. And, and here is a, 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 a city called Wakanai. If you go there today, we can see the old uh, cable landing station. So um, uh, there's a place called Sakanoshita. Nothing around it these days. But so you can see uh, um, the remaining of the cable landing station. So for decades, people didn't care about this building. People didn't know what it is. But finally, the local government realized that this is the uh, old cable landing station. I went to this place uh, last year. And another cable landing station in the old time was in Bakkai. So it's a very remote village in uh, near uh, uh, Wakanai. And I went there and I found this uh, cable landing station, old cable landing station. This is very old and almost uh, destroyed. Not, not destroyed, but so uh, it was abandoned during the wartime because the cable was cut. 
So during wartime, communication infrastructure is targeted and destroyed. So that's the um, um, unfortunate aspect uh, of the war. And so it's happening uh, all over the world in today's world. And I went to Hawaii just 10 years ago to spend one year uh, at the East West Center, so next to University of Hawaii. So my colleagues were very angry with me, but I did some research on undersea cables and uh, cyber security. In the past, so King of Kalakaua, so uh, Hawaii was an independent uh, kingdom. Uh, at that time, King Kalakaua was there, and he came to Japan in 1881. So he was the uh, first head, uh, first state head to visit Japan in the Japanese history. And we were very happy to have him. And so King Kalakaua met uh, Emperor Meiji, and he requested three things. So first, more immigrants from Japan to Hawaii. And second one, so it didn't happen, but King's uh, niece uh, uh, to Japanese royal family. So one of the um, um, uh, prince might get um, uh, 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 married with uh, King's niece, but it didn't happen, unfortunately. But third request was submarine cable between Hawaii and Japan. It also didn't happen because there was a big turmoil in Japanese politics at that time. Um, but so those things were uh, 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 considered at that time in the late uh, 19th century. At that time, the world um, cables, submarine cables were uh, almost controlled by the British Empire. So they called it all red line. So the British colonies were connected by uh, um, cables. The last part of the all red line was the Pacific uh, side. Um, 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 at that time, the, there are many, many European countries and United States are trying to lay cables uh, to connect to their overseas territories. But Britain, the United Kingdom, occupied 66%, uh, almost two thirds of the cables were dominated, controlled by the British Empire. The last part was uh, Pacific side. And see, they wanted to connect Vancouver and so New Zealand, Fiji, and other cities. But the US, against the British um, 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 plan, they said, so Hawaii is a um, friend of the United States. And so the United Kingdom should not connect to Hawaii uh, at that time. So instead, the UK government decided to connect to Funding Island, so Tabu Alain, Tabu Alain, sorry, Tabu Ryan um, um, Island uh, today, um, but so they could not connect to Hawaii at that time. But what happened uh, in Hawaii? So at that time, so the United States was thinking to expand uh, their uh, influence to Asia. Uh, there's a National Geographic magazine at that time. It says the influence of submarine cables upon military and naval supremacy. Finally, so John Mackay uh, succeeded in installing Pacific Cable without the government subsidies. Other companies are struggling to uh, lay cables with government subsidy. But so they, he said, so, okay, I can install it. And he finally made a connection between uh, Hawaii and San Francisco. Today, we can see the remains of the, uh, the, that cable, uh, the first cable connected to Hawaii. You know the location of um, uh, this sea, so it's close to the uh, diamond head. Still, at the bottom of the sea, we can see the um, uh, first cable connected to Hawaii. But this cable was also um, 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 not in use anymore, of course, but so these cables are connecting those cities and the, um, states and countries in the 19th century. Uh, during the whole time, those cables were lost because we uh, uh, started using wireless cables these days. So here's my uh, last slide. So Japan, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, so uh, could lay submarine cables to surrounding islands and regions as they wanted to expand their uh, influence over these territories. 
And also uh, Hawaii was also uh, trying to connect um, uh, cables to the uh, Hawaiian islands, but um, the cable connection coincided with the annexation, annexation of the kingdom of Hawaii by the United States. United States wanted to expand their influence over Asia and Asia Pacific. So they were, so cables were connected um, um, with um, 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 territorial um, uh, uh, intentions. So it's a very unfortunate side of the history, but this is co um, uh, happening at that time. So submarine cables, um, important political economic infrastructure uh, 100 years ago, and it is still um, um, a, a cables are playing an important role. So during the wartime, so those cables are disconnected, are sometimes destroyed. And so we have to worry about the same thing today. That's my uh, concern these days. So thank you very much. I want to stop here. So I will uh, uh, go back, uh, uh, um, pass my mic to Christy. Thank you very much. Aloha, thank you very much. Uh, so Motohiro gave us some helpful history. So I'm going to turn now to the present day. And uh, my remarks are with regard to the Pacific Islands region uh, specifically. Now, as you would realize, geopolitics has been dominating discussions of the Pacific Islands region with regard to many different sectors and topics for uh, some, uh, some time now in recent years. Outside actors may see undersea cable infrastructure through a lens of geopolitical competition, but the main argument of my research for this project is that political leaders in the Pacific Islands region have different views. So that's what I'm going to share with you briefly today. For my research, I looked at statements by Pacific Island leaders, uh, so that's uh, leaders and ministers in Pacific governments, and I also looked at uh, the documents and statements coming out of the Pacific Islands Forum, which is a regional body in the Pacific. Uh, and so analysing those public statements and documents has helped me to come to the argument that I'm going to share with you today. Just to give a bit of Pacific context first, the Pacific Islands region has limited connectivity. Unlike the, uh, the cables, lots of cables we saw going around Japan and so on in Motohiro's presentation, in the contemporary setting in the Pacific Islands region, there are still countries with no cable connectivity. Uh, there are some countries with just one cable, other countries with two cables and a small number of countries with more than two cables. At present, Tuvalu and Nauru are both independent nations that do not have cable connectivity, but in both cases, they've been promised cable connectivity by donor partners. Indeed, there's been much activity in the past 12 months regarding cable announcements from both donor partners and also from businesses. Now to introduce the Pacific Islands region, which was a focus of my research, the Pacific Islands Forum is a regional organization that has 18 members and two associate members. It coordinates regional efforts towards the achievement of the goals stipulated in the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent. These efforts are aimed at the development of the region and are undertaken in the context of what's known as an expanded concept of security as defined in the Bow Declaration on Regional Security. So I looked at these documents and others to see how undersea cables are described and referred to. I found that undersea cables are not mentioned in the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent, nor are they mentioned in the implementation plan for the 2050 strategy. Indeed, undersea cables are not mentioned in the Bow Declaration either. Nonetheless, cables form part of the enabling infrastructure that could allow the achievement of the development goals that are stipulated by the region in their documents. Uh, indeed, connectivity is something that the Pacific uh, is, is wanting to, to expand upon and improve, as outlined in these documents. 
Interestingly, undersea cables are mentioned in one of the key strategy documents of the Pacific Islands Forum. This is the Pacific Regional E-Commerce Strategy and Roadmap of 2021. Uh, this is an important document in the Pacific Islands Forum because one of their goals is to try to enhance uptake of e-commerce with the ultimate aim of improving people's livelihoods. Now, expansion of undersea cable networks is mentioned in the Pacific Regional E-Commerce Strategy and Roadmap, as I said, in, in a number of places, actually, uh, and overall in the that document, they argue that expansion of undersea cable networks could be useful for increasing e-commerce uptake and use, uh, possibly along with relevant appropriate satellite technologies. Now, uh, what I've uh, found and what I'm arguing in the paper that's part of this project that is uh, going to be coming out in, in the journal Marine Policy, we hope if all goes well, is that Pacific leaders so ministers and leaders of countries, as well as the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, Henry Puna, they care about connectivity. They're interested in trying to ensure that people and communities in Pacific Island countries have uh, access to digital technologies that they can use at an affordable price. They do discuss cable funding options with donor partners, uh, and there's many examples of uh, Pacific Island government leaders approaching donors about uh, cable connectivity and discussing that with them. But what do Pacific leaders think about geopolitics? Well, my, uh, my theory is that Pacific leaders would like to avoid discussions of, of geopolitics where they can. Uh, and one example that I found is when in 2018, the then Prime Minister of Vanuatu approached the then Prime Minister of Australia and asked for funding for a second cable for Vanuatu and said, it's not about politics, it's just about that we want the cable. So um, my understanding is that Pacific leaders try to avoid engaging in discussions about geopolitics if they can, but when geopolitics must be acknowledged, Pacific leaders present a stance of being open to engagement with all parties. There's a Pacific-wide approach that's oft cited and frequently uh, also touted as being the national policy of various countries, and this is of being friends to all and enemies to none. Pacific leaders are concerned that geopolitics could be a distraction from their development goals, and this is acknowledged in one of the uh, security assessment documents of the Pacific Islands Forum. Indeed, from the Pacific Islands Forum documents that I looked at, it's clear that the Pacific Islands Forum is open to engagement with multiple partners, and I think this is similar with government leaders from various Pacific countries. In summary, I would like to suggest that Pacific Island leaders are concerned about whether there's a cable connection for a country or an island that does not yet have one, or perhaps a place where there's only one cable and they want to ensure that there's another cable to allow for resiliency and redundancy. I suggest that it may not matter to a Pacific leader, whether China, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, or someone else funds a new undersea cable as long as, as long as it's laid and provides connectivity. So I feel there's divergence between endogenous views of undersea cables and exogenous perspectives from outside the region. Instead of concentrating their attention on geopolitical matters, Pacific leaders, at least in their public statements and documents, are focused on trying to afford, uh, trying to achieve, sorry, affordable and reliable connectivity for their government departments, their citizens and businesses operating in their countries. Uh, as a part of this project uh, and for the, for the paper, I was asked to think about policy recommendations. And one key policy recommendation I can suggest is that donor efforts align directly with the region's development goals rather than geopolitical considerations. I think if donors can try to uh, look at what the region is articulating about what they want in the 2050 strategy, as well as national government strategies, uh, that, would, that would really help uh, in allowing them to work together uh, with Pacific Island countries and the region towards their goals. 
Thanks for allowing the opportunity to share some of the key findings of the paper, uh, which I hope will be out uh, sometime later this year. I'll hand back to Christy now. Thanks, Christy. Great, thank you so much Molohiro and Amanda for those very interesting presentations. So now the three of us will um, engage in a bit of discussion. I see we already have some questions coming in from the audience, so please keep them coming. Um, just to kind of get the discussion started, I um, wanted to ask, you know, there are so many different kinds of potential risks to think about to cable networks. So particularly for uh, Multihero, because you were focusing more on the historical case. If you're thinking about um, the contemporary environment, what do you see as the most important risks or threats to undersea cables right now? And how should policymakers be thinking about addressing them? Uh, thank you, Christy. So uh, as you said earlier, uh, so there are many possible um, reasons for destruction of cables. So first one is the fishing nets. So some fishing boats are, um, are trying to get fish at the bottom of the, of the sea. So those nets are uh, uh, distracting the cables. And the other one is the um, 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 anchors of the big uh, boat or fish and uh, uh, ships. So those are destroying. So I think more than 90% of the uh, cable destruction caused by uh, uh, fishing and so uh, anchors. But as you said, so volcanoes and other things and, and earthquakes are um, it's a big, big impact in 2011 in Japan. So the, we had a big earthquake and tsunamis. So many cables were lost. But so um, more than 10 years, I'm worrying about the um, human activities to destroy cables. Uh, if you don't mind, I just want to show a picture, uh, just okay. one picture. So this is a... Uh, latest manhole in um, in one of the advanced countries. So I visited two months ago. So um, it's a remote area, so people don't come usually, but it's easy to identify the location actually. So I went to the new site and so I found the news that new cables are laid here. And so I checked the photos and so I went to the Google and Google Maps tells me, oh, it must be there. So I went there and I found this manhole and took a picture. So it's easy to identify the cable location. You don't need to go um, and go uh, down to the bottom of the sea. So cables are um, pulled in, on the land. And so this dry part is the most dangerous place actually. So if you open up the manhole and so slow a bomb and maybe use um, um, machines to cut cables, it's possible. So ordinary person like me can do that. So terrorists might do that, enemies can do that. I'm worrying about it. It's not happened yet. So only uh, very exceptional things happen, but not happening um, um, in the daily basis. But it's possible. That's my concern these days. Christy, perhaps I could mention in terms of policy recommendations, there's a paper that was published by Samuel Bashfield and Anthony Bergen in 2022 with the National Security College at the Australian National University, which argues for Australia and other countries helping uh, less developed countries with best practice cable protection zones. Uh, and this is is relating to what Motohiro said at the outset about discarded fishing gear or fishing nets or ships anchors damaging cables. Uh, if the um, if the Australian model of setting up exclusion zones where people cannot fish or operate vessels um, could perhaps be applied elsewhere uh, and introduced elsewhere, it may be able to help with reducing some of these impacts of uh, the ship's anchors and so on. Uh, so, for instance, a ship's anchor damaged a cable in Solomon Islands in May 2023. And so there are plenty of examples of, of that kind of thing. And um, I just wanted to make that contribution. Thanks. Great, thank you. I mean, just to take a step back for a moment, I think the two presentations are very interesting and really complement the results of the overall project because I think Multihero's presentation gives us a strong sense of, you know, the historical importance of these cables, which is now renewed in the new context of the internet, but is 
essentially was connected to geopolitics in the historical era. And for a country like Hawaii that didn't have connectivity, it was important enough to be one of the three things they asked Japan for, right? So I think that we see also um, parallels to countries who really see this connectivity as essential to development or potential opportunities, right? And who are kind of on the other side. Um, and thanks for um, that addition as well, Amanda. I think that you know your paper really brings out the difference in the geopolitics perceptions. And just to add, we had another person who really looked at uh, the private sector um, perspectives, which I think we also saw a lot of kind of parallels to what Amanda was saying about you know this is mostly a development or economic um, kind of concern you know for companies, or they wonder you know is the government intervention by really that useful? Is it kind of ad hoc? Is it will it be sustained? in the future. Um, and I think also a lot of unintended consequences questions. So like, for example, if it's forbidden to do business with China, in some cases, does this actually disadvantage, for example, American or Japanese companies in the long run, because it forecloses certain opportunities for them and opens up opportunities for Chinese companies. So I think, you know, the dynamics that we're talking about in both papers, um, you know, they're paralleled not only among countries, but among companies. And there are a lot of questions about these geopolitics and what they mean. Um, so we have a number of questions in the chat now. There's one question particularly about the South China Sea, which um, neither of our current presenters uh, addressed, but I will say there was a paper that um, the SIPA staff can put the link in the chat now by Alina Noor, who looks specifically at Southeast Asia. And I would say that a lot of the concerns with uh, among Southeast Asian countries are similar to what Amanda expressed about development being a priority, about just, um, you know, with the digitalization priorities in Southeast Asia being very prominent. And so she does talk about I mean, in particular, the question asker asked about team telecom and the politicization of, of those kinds of um, countries doing uh, business with China. So I would encourage you to check that article out um, if you're interested. Do um, Amanda or Motohiro, do you want to add anything on Southeast Asia or the South China Sea in terms of China specifically? Maybe Amanda first, I will pull up. Uh, well, actually, I was just keen to just mention something you were talking, I presume, Christy, before referring to Haley Channer's pa paper when you were talking about the private sector views. And I think that link for that was just put in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the I just wanted to add to what you said about the private sector, because uh, I found Haley's short paper very interesting and accessible. And one of the things that uh, I remember from reading that was that uh, the private sector uh, people she interviewed also referred to um, difficulties with navigating different government arrangements. So, for instance, it might be that in a country, if they want to connect a cable, they need to have authorization from the department that deals with communications. So, say that country's Department of in Information and Communication Technology, but then they might also need to have a business license from a different government department and they might also need to liaise with another government department for something else and so on. So, um, I was just uh, struck by, by that difficulty that um, private sector, you know, hours are money for them. So, that's a lot of effort and, and and time and well money that they have to put into trying to organize these things. Sorry, that's not on the topic of South China Sea, but it was just something I was thinking about when you were talking about the private sector. Um, the one I'm not thing to add to that, I would just say that we did also have another collaborator, Tara Davenport, who wrote about Southeast Asia and legal regimes. And so she she discussed a lot about these different regulatory issues. So to kind of answer my own question about the threats, I think one thing that came out of the of the project as a whole was that, you know, we can't just think about, you know, laying new cables, like that's not the only problem, you need to think about the whole life cycle of the cable from um, construction to maintenance to repair to, you know, all of these issues. And actually, it's a huge threat to cables if you can't send a repair ship in to repair something if it gets destroyed, right? So if, if regulatory things are barriers, etc, this is actually a huge problem and can delay, um, you know, connectivity in very important ways. Multahiro, did you want to add anything on that? Yes. Um, so, um, um, so a few minutes ago, Amanda talked about the safe zone for the cable protection. And that's, that's a great idea. And so, um, 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 Japanese um, uh, operators are also trying to ask the uh, fishermen don't do fishing this area, so they are trying to protect the zones. But it means that so nobody else is doing fishing in that point. So it means that lots of fish there. So some bad-minded people trying to fish there. That's a pr 
problem. And international waters, that's more complicated. So if we ask the um, um, foreign fishermen, don't do fishing in that area, but they are trying to still fish in those areas. It's happening East China Sea and South China Sea. And so those areas are um, um, the frequent points, frequent incidents uh, of cable destruction actually. And Vietnam, so there are many, many cable laws these days. And I'm worrying about Singapore, so um, Malacca Straits. So if you fly over Malacca Straits, so lots of lots of tankers and ships, um, ships cargoes uh, on the sea, but at the bottom of the sea, too many cables are laid at the bottom of the Malacca Straits. So if somebody blow the tray, so um, we cannot use the poles, we cannot use the sea lane, we cannot use the communication infrastructure. So that's, that's a big disaster. I'm probably I'm worrying too much, but so I'm always thinking about those things. And South China Sea must be uh, the first point of the cable uh, loss. And when we see um, um, conflict in East Asia, so we, uh, how we can prepare for that? It's it's quite a difficult, but so we, uh, I am worrying about that. So we have several different questions about the relationship between satellites and undersea cables. So the questions to combine them um, are about the extent to which these are complementary, or are satellites going to replace? Um, undersea cables. So um, could one of you perhaps just speak to that? That is a question that we discussed, I know, as well in our conference. So, so, hero... yeah, yeah, go ahead, Montahiro. Montahiro. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, I was just going to say that, um, yes, that is an interesting development that's happening in the Pacific Islands region as well. Uh, so with the Starlink uh, low Earth orbit satellite technology becoming available, this is quite a hot policy topic in Pacific Island countries. Uh, so Samoa and other countries have been grappling with trying to work out how to respond to this. Do they allow people to bring in Starlink equipment at airports and seaports or do they uh, need to impose some sort of import duties in which case uh, in some small Pacific Island countries they've been confiscating um, equipment or not allowing it in while they're trying to work out all these things. Uh, it's uh, it's really a, a difficult one because uh, policymakers and telecommunications regulators are, are trying to catch up. But in the meantime, there's already been use of satellites in the Pacific Islands region for communications for a long time. Uh, so O3B has been used, the O3B satellite uh, system has been used by telecommunication companies in the Pacific, including in Papua New Guinea to provide connectivity. Also Pacific, which is a geostationary satellite that's situated above the Pacific Islands region has been offering connectivity and can also sometimes be a backup uh, if a cable is, for instance, damaged or inoperable for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, there's different, different options. Uh, cables are generally considered cheaper and more reliable, but then uh, uh, the satellites can provide alternatives or backups. Uh, and in addition to that, of course, the, the situation may be changing as low earth orbit satellite technologies continue to be developed. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Amanda. Um, from the historical perspective, so uh, during the Second World War, we lost most of the undersea cables. And then, so we had the satellite technology came in 1950s. So um, we were very happy to use the satellites for international communication, but it's satellite communication at the time was slower and very expensive. So if I make a phone call from Tokyo to Hawaii, so I have to say, hello, hello, that kind of thing. So uh, latency happened. And so I, we have to pay a lot of money for uh, telephone connection. But after the 1980s, we had the uh, optic fiber cable came in. So that's very fast and much, much cheaper. That's why we are dependent on undersea cables. So more than 90%, 95% of the international traffic goes through undersea cable these days because satellites are 
uh, expensive and slower. So we cannot move um, all the bandwidth to satellites these days. It's technically impossible. But so in the Pacific Island countries, so they need a cable connection, of course, but sometimes they are strapped into installed cables. Then they are using, uh, uh, as Amanda said, lower uh, Leo uh, satellites, That's, and they are making constellations. Lots of lots of um, uh, satellites uh, flying over you like uh, 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 Starlink, and so it might be uh, another option for Pacific Island countries, or maybe um, 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 war zones and conflict zones, other things. But so main main technology is undersea cable, so. Um, it's um, satellites, cables are not complementary enough. So I think we have to depend on cables these days. So we have a lot of questions coming in. So several questions have to do broadly with potential security risks related to China. So perhaps we could address that. So maybe in general, could you both speak to what you see as the risks from China? And so two are mentioned in some of the questions. One is the potential of uh, espionage or cybersecurity risk. And the other that's mentioned is the potential of cable cutting in a conflict scenario. The one that the question asker gives is a Taiwan Strait conflict um, example. But so those are, of course, two of the general risks that we discussed at the beginning. And, you know, there are also kinds of economic dependence risks, et cetera. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about um, what risks you see from China and then also, you know, the to what degree you're worried about them or do we see evidence that this is occurring? Maybe I'll like start. So, um... Yeah, there are some risks actually. So especially on the dry part, so not wet part. So dry part, I mean the cable landing station on the ground. So we need a lot of facilities, equipment inside the cable landing station. One of them is SLTE, submarine line terminal equipment. So it's a huge refrigerator size, big, big um, um, machines. So we need a lot of those machines inside the cable landing station if we cross the many cables. And those machines are just computers, a kind of computers. So um, it might be some kind of uh, supply chain risk. So um, bad software might be in there or bad hardware might be in there. It's possible for any manufacturer to install that kind of um, uh, bad products inside the cable landing station. So we are worrying about Chinese manufacturers might do that kind of thing. But uh, to be fair, so um, other governments, including democratic countries, um, doing the same thing under legal framework. So we have to stop um, wars, we have to stop terrorism attacks, we have to stop the diplomatic surprise, so that's why the government is sometimes monitoring communications of undersea cables, including the US, including the United Kingdom, including Australia, and of course other uh, authoritarian regimes are doing the same thing. But the big difference is that, so the government is under the legal control or not. So that's an important aspect. If the political leaders can do those kind of wiretapping monitoring um, with their own desire, so it's not good. And those um, um, monitoring might be used politically, it's not good. So um, national security or diplomacy, those kind of um, purposes under legal restriction is important. So um, technically it's easier, that's a, a problem, but we have to control those activities under democratic regime. That's my point. Just yes. to, on that point, I would just add that um, in Alina Noir's piece on Southeast Asia, this concern about surveillance did come up, um, not just surveillance from China, but also from the US as being a concern that was expressed by some of the people she interviewed in uh, Southeast Asia. So I know that one point she made was that, you know, Section 702 of the US Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act still permits US intelligence agencies to conduct surveillance on foreigners abroad and all of these kinds of questions. So I think that for countries that, again, are not um, as convinced by the geopolitical competition narrative, they're concerned about 
security risks from a variety of sources, not just China. So just to add note that point. Amanda, please. Oh, yes, I was just going to say that um, my understanding is also like Motohiro that data exfiltration is perhaps easier from cable landing stations or places where people don't have to get their toes wet rather than out in the deep ocean where it's obviously very difficult to, to work, to, to do anything at great depths under huge pressure, lack of light and so on. Um, so yes, uh, I don't know a lot about technically how it works, but I, I do understand uh, that data exfiltration is, is a concern. Uh, and similarly, uh, Christy, to what you were saying in terms of cybersecurity, uh, yes, um, scholars, uh, including some at the National Security College here at the Australian National University, have written about the law that China has uh, in place to, um, to mean that Chinese technology companies may need to hand over data of their users and of course that relates to the concerns in the United States, Australia and elsewhere about the social media platform TikTok uh, but similarly with the undersea cables I guess the concern is that well if a Chinese company has laid a cable or owns a cable or has access to a cable somehow maybe there would be cyber security risks but I also wanted to make the point that companies such as Huawei have always denied that uh, they're, they're doing anything like that. So I think the story is perhaps not as black and white as, uh, as, uh, as some may think. Right, and I think there are also concerns related to, for example, there were news stories um, in the relatively recent past about um, cable laying ships from China and just the fact that they know where the cables are is also sort of a, a risk. You know, So I think that there's many different layers of concerns depending on who you talk to regarding um, threats from China. But then again, as we're pointing to, there's a variety of perspectives on you know how important or likely those are among the universe of threats that exist. Um, so there are a number of questions about sort of the, the most feared scenario, which is that you know cables are cut in conflict and questions about, you know, what can countries do to really prepare against that situation? Um, and also, if you happen to know, you know, what would be the procedure? So, for example, if cable destruction occurs, you know, who investigates, you know, what what would that look like, you know, in terms of the process? So maybe if we could talk about prevention and reaction to cable destruction, um, that would be, I think, of a great interest to several people in the audience asking questions. Um, maybe from me. Um, um, so one of the worst case scenario was the um, disruption of cable during the Tokyo Olympic Games. So um, um, it might, but so we didn't have an audience at the stadium uh, in 2021, unfortunately. So it was not a, a big uh, trophy for the terrorism attack. So that's why it didn't happen. But um, Cable cutting is not happened break uh, breaks out alone. So it might be connected with other um, destructive activities. So maybe if you want to control the um, financial market, you might cut the cable, but it's it's very risky. So if we want to do something more, more than um, just an incident, so uh, you want to. Um, um, Occupy Taiwan Strait and Taiwan, sorry, Taiwan Island. Maybe you have to cut cables um, in Taiwan Strait. And so cable cutting is the part of the larger uh, operation. Uh, that should be uh, uh, the worst case scenario. So uh, James W. Um, um, Admiral, former Admiral of the United States Navy, so wrote a novel called uh, titled 2034, if I remember it correctly. So that's a worst case scenario. So cable cutting might cause a nuclear attack between great powers. It's 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 too much. But so we are too much dependent on uh, undersea cables these days. So how we can protect it, it's quite difficult, but uh, I want to stress the role of ICPC, so International Cable Protection Committee. So it's a private sector consortium uh, of the cable uh, operators, cable suppliers, and uh, some governments and so uh, industry groups. They are trying to protect the cables. So we, because we are 
uh, it's a cable is a critical infrastructure for everyone, even for terrorists, even for enemies. So they are dependent on cables. How we can protect those cables? We have to talk with the um, private sector, so uh, the government, and how we can collaboratively so um, protect the cables. And there are many, many military cables uh, there. So it, it's another concern. So uh, enemies might cut military, target military cables. So um, it's really complicated. So we have to understand what's going on and how we can protect those cables. Amanda? Oh, yes. Well, um, the impact of the cutting of or somehow inoperability of a cable can be huge. Uh, examples from the Pacific include in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands in 2015, when there at that time they only had one cable and when the cable became inoperable for some reason, possibly due to strong currents in the area, uh, it was a huge impact with banking down and, of course, the internet down and so on. Uh, a more recent example was the massive volcanic eruption near the main island of the Kingdom of Tonga in January 2022. Uh, and that caused, uh, of course, the volcano unfortunately led to loss of life and, and other impacts. But in, in terms of the communication disruption, caused huge distress for people in the Tongan diaspora around the world who were unable to communicate with their relatives in Tonga to find out if they were alive, injured, had water, etc., etc., uh, for days on end. I know that a Tongan colleague here was um, six days in, still had had no contact whatsoever with anyone in Tonga. So it's very distressing. But uh, Christy, your question, as I recall, talked about or asked about responses. Uh, and I think that's where sometimes satellite technology of various forms could come in to assist. So for instance, the initial, initially the only information, the only communication in and out of Tonga uh, immediately following that volcano was using the very small number of satellite phones that were in Tonga, including one at the Australian High Commission there. Uh, and then there was also some uh, satellite dishes at the University of the South Pacific campuses that people were then able to start using to communicate. So um, I think that, uh, yeah, the, the cables can be reliable and generally are reliable until they're for some reason disrupted and then that can have huge impacts and maybe that is a place where a range of satellite technologies can perhaps provide that backup or redundancy uh, option. There are a stunning amount of things to think about, you know, in terms of trying to plan for resilience. And that was something that we talked about at the conference, too, is sort of what does it mean to be resilient? How can you really ensure resilience in this type of network? Is it just a matter of having more cables? Is it, you know, what kinds, you know, is it a problem that this geopolitics is leading to potential fragmentation of cable networks and what would that means? So I think that um, we've really just started to, to scratch the surface of a lot of these issues. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I just want to give a chance for our panelists. Would you like to say anything in terms of closing remarks or closing thoughts? Maybe Multihero, anything from your end? Oh, um, nothing much, but so uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. So um, I talked about geopolitics uh, uh, in my main focus, but I hope I'm worrying too much. So. Um, so the world must be more peaceful, I hope. So um, we, we are dependent on cables. I love cables so much. So we, let's protect cables together. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful closing message. Amanda, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks. Just that the short papers that are already published as part of this cables project through the centre that you run, uh, Christy, uh, are really a good read, very easy to read uh, and quite interesting. And then, um, yeah, I, I guess the centre will also notify people once our other papers are out. So uh, perhaps follow the centre if you can, if you want to, to find out when our papers are ready. <laughs> Exactly. So just to wrap up briefly, um, as uh, Amanda has said, we are working on another set of papers that it will be out hopefully sometime in the coming months. If you have attended or registered for this webinar, we will send you links to these message to these uh, articles that are out and as well as a notification when those are out as well, but do keep an eye out. 
Um, I think that undersea cables are often considered to be a rather niche or narrow issue, but I think our discussion today has really demonstrated that they're intertwined with a lot of things that we consider to be fundamental to the way that our society function. And they're also intertwined with huge debates in international relations. Um, so they found themselves on the front lines of, of both of those things. So um, again, we're grateful for the support of the Japan Foundation in making this project possible, as well as the partnership of Keio University and Khalifa University. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson and Dr. Tuchia for joining us today. And we also want to thank and give a shout out to our other authors on the project, Haley Channer, Mizuho Kajiwara, uh, Justin Sherman, Alina Noor, Christian Buger, Jagannath Panda, uh, Brendan Cannon, Tara Davenport, Luigi Martino, and Ash Rossiter. And we're also thankful to our senior advisors from government and the private sector who came came to join us for our workshop and who were so generous in offering us really candid perspectives that I think helped us a lot. And to all the experts in Honolulu, of course, who um, were discussants and offered insights. So thank you, everybody. Um, for the Center for Indo-Pacific Affairs, our next event is scheduled for June 17 at 2 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time with Brad Glosserman from Tama University and Pacific Forum. Forum. He'll be talking about his new co-edited volume with Gilbert Rosman on Japan's rise as a regional and global power, 2013 to 2023. So we look forward to seeing you then. And again, thanks so much to our panelists and our audience today.